Yeah, there Welcome to United Lutheran Church of Proctor. We come together today to hear the word of God as it is provided by ELCA's resource called Worship in the Home, found at blogs.elca.org slash worship. Thank you to all the readers today in order of their appearance. Myself, Dennis Palm, Alice Halverson, Karen Nolan, Carol Johnson, Dan Serla, and Kathy Jezuski. Bolded areas may be read by all. Thank you to Pastor Judy Anderson Bauer and musician Dennis Palm, as each of them will be sharing their faith, the word, and music, respectively. Do we have any announcements? Good morning, everyone. Welcome to worship. This is the second Sunday in Lent, and we're going to talk some more this week about the covenants that God makes throughout the, the cycle of the, the Old Testament with the people of faith. Remember that we will be celebrating communion today, so please have bread and wine or juice and crackers available for that. And remember that the work of the church continues, so please either mail your offerings into the church office or you can contribute online. Please remember to mute yourself when you are not speaking and unmute yourself when you are. We are also having Lenten services at noon every Wednesday. They're only about 20, 25 minutes, so please join us. The, the link for joining is the same as this link. And you will be getting a letter this week, but I can announce today we are going to have a special congregational meeting Sunday, March 28th, which is Palm Sunday, at 11 a.m. to vote on a sharing agreement with our saviors, a sharing of a pastor with our saviors Lutheran in West Duluth. That's again, a special congregational meeting. So again, we like the annual meeting, we need 50 people to be there. Please, 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 everybody you know who is your friend, and a member, family members, please invite them to be with us that day. Prayer concerns today um, for Dick Rowe, for Margie Thorson, Sue Schwartz's mom, Clarice, Jan Baki, and Alice Summers' sister, Margaret. And we'll continue to keep the folks in the Southern United States, especially Texas in our prayers as they recover from the winter storm over the last week. Let's join together in worship. I will now share my screen so that you can easily follow along. Let's begin our service with the prayer of the day. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit will be, or be with us all, amen. Let us pray. O oh God, by the passions of your blessed Son, you made an instrument of shameful <clears throat> death to be for us the means of life. Grant us so to glory in the cross of, cross of Christ that we may gladly suffer shame and loss for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The first reading is from Genesis 17, 1 through 7, and then 15 through 16. When Abraham, or when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. And I will make my covenant between me and you, and will make you exceedingly numerous. Then Abram fell on his face, and God said, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You shall be the ancestor of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the ancestor of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful and will make nations of you and kings shall come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you 
throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. God said to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her and she shall give rise to nations. Kings of peoples shall come from her. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Alice Halverson, you need to come off mute. Okay, can you hear me? Sorry. Okay, Psalms 22, 23 to 31 verses. You who fear the Lord, give praise. All of you of Jacob's line, give glory. Stand in awe of the Lord, all you offspring of Israel. For the Lord does not despise nor abhor the poor in their poverty. Neither is the Lord face hidden from them. But when they cry out, the Lord hears them. From <clears throat> you comes my praise in the great assembly. I will perform my vows in the sight of those who fear the Lord. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. All those who seek the Lord give praise. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. All the families of the nation shall bow before God. For dominion belongs to the Lord who rules over the nations. Indeed, all who sleep in the earth shall bow down and worship. All who go down to the dust through may be dead shall kneel before the Lord. Their descendants shall serve the Lord whom they shall proclaim to generations to come. They shall proclaim, proclaim God's deliverance to a people yet unborn, saying to them, the Lord has acted. <clears throat> the second reading is from Romans chapter four, verses 13 to 25. The promise that Abraham would inherit the world did not come to him or his descendants through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. If it, is, if it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, neither is there violation. For this reason, it depends on faith in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all Abraham's descendants, not only to the adherents of the law, but also to those who share the faith of Abraham, for he is the father of us all, as it is written. I have made you the father of many nations. In the presence of the God in whom Abraham believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. Hoping against hope, Adam, Abraham believed that he would become the father of many nations according to what was said. So numerous shall your descendants be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was already as good as dead, for he was about a hundred years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No distrust made Abraham waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, being fully convinced that God was able to do what God had promised. Therefore, his faith was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now the words, it was reckoned to him, were written not for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be reckoned to us who believe in the one who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was handed over to death for our trespasses and was raised for our justification. Word of God, word of life. 
Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great sufferings and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. Jesus said all this openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, Jesus rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowds with his disciples and said to them, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? For the those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. The Gospel according to the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Having read these words, think on this. In Mark, Jesus identity is a secret until it is told openly in the church after his death and resurrection. But in today's gospel reading, the first of three passion predictions in Mark, Jesus speaks boldly and openly about that coming death. All three of the passion predictions are accompanied with words about our discipleship. Today, resisting Peter, Jesus makes clear that this discipleship involves honesty about death, Taking up the cross is not self-torture. There is already enough suffering in the world. Rather, it is telling the truth that we die and it is ready to be suffered for the gospel if we must. So Peter did suffer martyrdom, but death is never the last word. By the power of the spirit poured out from Christ's death, we are brought to faith like the faith of the last word. By the power of the spirit poured out from Christ's death, we are brought to faith like the faith of Abraham. Trust in God who gives life to the dead. Trust from two old people who were as good as dead. In the resurrection, Jesus, our Lord, is made alive. By baptism, God makes us alive together with Christ. Like Abraham and Sarah, we too are given a new identity. We are named children of God and co-heirs with Christ. And we turn in love and service towards all those many people who are being invited also to trust in God, like Abraham and Sarah. Friends in Christ, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Creator and from Jesus the Savior. Amen. Joanna fell in love with Peter. They dated for about 10 months and then they finally decided they wanted to get married. On a lovely September day with the red and orange and yellow leaves drifting down in Joanna's backyard, the couple made their vows to each other. Peter, said Joanna, I promise to love you as long as you still have a good job. I promise to be your wife until it gets too hard. I promise to be faithful to you until somebody more handsome comes along. Peter said, Joanna, I promise to be with you until my job becomes more important than you. I promise to love you until you lose your good looks. I promise to be faithful to you until I meet somebody who loves me more. I just made all that up, right? I've never been to a wedding like that. I hope you haven't either. We know that the vows people make in a wedding when they are getting married are more permanent than that. Though sometimes, tragically, they aren't. But we understand that the vows two people make to each other aren't just about loving each other when it's easy, but about promising to be with someone through thick and thin for the rest of your life, in joy and in sorrow, in plenty and in want, in sickness and in health, 
to love and to cherish as long as we both shall live. That's what a marriage vow is supposed to be. It's a solemn, sacred promise that we're going to be in a relationship with this person. We call that kind of promise a covenant. It's more than a contract, more than a purchase agreement, more than a list of duties. And marriage is the covenant we know best because it, and it's then the best way for us to understand what God's talking about in the covenants of the Old Testament. And we'll be hearing a lot of those during Lent. So from the first reading, and God said to Abram, as for me, this is my covenant with you. You shall be the ancestor of a multitude of nations. Now, last week, we talked about the covenant God made with all of creation after the flood to never destroy the earth again. God said, as for me, I am establishing my covenant with you and your descendants after you and with every living creature that is with you. Never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. And next week, we're going to hear about the covenant God made with the people of Israel and Mount Sinai. And then, of course, at the end of Lent, on Monday, Thursday, we'll hear about the Last Supper, how Jesus gave his body and blood as a new covenant, promising us forgiveness. God's been making covenants for a long, old time. Now, there's a few major differences between the covenants that God makes with us and the covenants we make with each other. In a marriage covenant, the two partners come as equal, as human beings. Both husband and wife have the same capacity for keeping and for breaking that relationship. The covenants that God makes are different because they're not between equals, because God is. God. God is limitless and all-powerful and all-knowing, unbounded by space and time. And humans are none of those things. We are extremely limited. We are often powerless. We are ignorant of so many things, and we are always bound by space and time. So a covenant with God is different than a covenant in marriage. With God's covenant, God shoulders most of the responsibility, promising to stay in the relationship no matter what we do. In the first covenant that God made after the flood, God didn't even ask anything of creation. It was a one-sided covenant. God did everything. Wouldn't matter how badly human beings screwed up because God promised never to destroy the earth again, period. With Abram and Sarai, whose names then get changed to Abraham and Sarah, God promised that their children would be as many as the stars in the sky and that God would give them a homeland. It wasn't really until the next covenant, the covenant with the freed Israelite slaves, that we start to get more expectations of the human side of the covenant. We'll hear more about that next week. But just to give you a little preview, God begins that Sinai covenant with a big promise. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. God starts that covenant by telling what has already been done, free, gratis, already taken care of. Israel didn't have to do anything to deserve God's salvation from slavery. God just set them free. No strings attached. So even in that covenant, the one that starts, uh, which begins the, the, with the Ten Commandments that we're familiar with out of the 572 total, even that covenant begins with God's love and God's grace and God's mercy. Only then did the commandment part, the here's your side of the deal, enter into the equation. The commandments were given as a way to be in a relationship with God because finally 
all covenants are about that. They're about a relationship, whether it's a marriage or a rainbow. It's about promises that establish we're going to be together in this. What makes covenant language different from a contract is, is this. When in a contract, if one party doesn't hold up their portion of the agreement, then the other side has no obligation to do anything. So for instance, if I sign a contract to buy a car, I agree to pay so much and then I get the car. If I don't pay that, they can come and take the car away. If I get home and the transmission falls out, they have to fix the car. A contract is a series of if-then clauses. You don't have to be in a relationship. I don't have to love the dealer from the car in order to buy the car. A covenant has no if-then clauses. A covenant establishes a relationship, which is meant to, uh, to cover a whole host of unforeseen situations. In a marriage, that's where we get into the for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health part. And that's what God does with us over and over and over again. God promises to be faithful even when we're not. That's why it's sometimes really hard to understand God's covenants. We keep thinking that maybe it's like a contract, you know, we keep thinking about those if then clauses. Well, if I go to church every Sunday, then God's going to love me. If I just believe, then I get to heaven. If I pray every day, then God will heal me. Our relationship with God doesn't work like that. It's not a contract. It's a covenant. And sometimes, sometimes we wonder why God doesn't just give up on us, walk away and hang it all up as a lost cause. I've had people say to me as a pastor, you know, God just can't love me because I've done this awful thing. And usually in situations like that, I answer something like, your God is too small. God is bigger than that. God is bigger than any of your stuff. The covenants God makes with us are forever and for always. And the last covenant that God made with you wasn't centuries ago, it was only a few years ago. It was on the day you were baptized. When that water splashed over your head, God made a promise, a covenant with you. God promised that you would be a beloved son, a beloved daughter of the kingdom of heaven forever. God named you. God promised that the Holy Spirit would live in you all the days of your life. That's a covenant. That's God's promise never to give up. That's God's promise that never ends. That's a promise of somebody who thinks you are to die for, literally. Not because of anything you've done to deserve it, just because you are. You don't ever need to be afraid that God's gonna walk away from you. God's covenant with you is strong and sure and trustworthy and absolutely unbreakable. Dear friends, may you always live in that sure and certain covenant that God has made with you. May you live and love and work and play knowing that there is nothing in all the world that can separate you from God. Amen.
on this second Sunday in Lent, let us pray for the church and for all people in need. Responding to each petition with words from today's psalm, hear us, we pray. God of mercy and might, bless your church throughout the world. Uphold those believers who suffer for the sake of your gospel. Strengthen the faith of all the baptized and make your presence felt by those unable to assemble for worship. When we cry out, O faithful God, hear us, we pray. As this week, we commemorate John and Charles Wesley. We ask you to bless, bless the Methodist churches around the globe. Unite in the promises of baptism, and in due time return us all to the joy of singing the hymns that Charles wrote. When we cry out, O warm-hearted God, hear us, we pray. Bless the earth, save the animals and their habitats from wild and uncontrolled weather. Teach humanity to live respectful of nature and to join you in tending to creation's well-being. We ask you to smile also on Mars. When we cry out, O wondrous God, hear us, we pray. Bless the nations of the world. Raise up ad advocates of peace and justice within and between nations. Give life where hope seems dead. Call into existence new realities we cannot even imagine. Lead all people around the world to receive the COVID-19 vaccine with gratitude to you. Grant to our Congress the wisdom and the will to improve the lives of all our residents. When we cry out, O righteous God, hear us, we pray. Bless all who suffer in body, mind, and spirit. We beg that you bring an end to the pandemic, restore medical systems, and comfort all who are sick or dying. Lead us, out of uh, lead us out of the practice of discrimination. Bring vindication for victims of injustice and relief to oppressed minorities. We, we remember before you those on our prayer list, servicemen, women serving our country, Bodie Page, Marge Thorson, Amber Spillman, Dave Fickner, Eddie Merling, Sarah Summer, Larry Summers' daughter, Alice Summers' sister, Margaret, Gary, nephew to Marge Lynn, Sue Schwartz's mother, Clarice, Gladys Haugen, Dan Bakke, Daryl Richard, Dick Rowe, and those in Texas still suffering from the storm. When we cry out, O benevolent God, hear us, we pray. Bless families, those in our community, those waiting at national borders, those whose struggles are known only to you. Keep children safe, sustain expectant parents and those facing infertility. Protect women in childbirth, accompany anyone who lives alone. Equip the ministries and services of church and state that attend to families in their needs. When we cry out, O loving God, hear us, we pray. Fill each one of us with hope and receive our personal prayers. When we cry out, O gracious God, hear us, we pray. Praises to you, O God, for centuries of saints whose faithfulness inspires our Lenten journey. Bless those who mourn the half million dead of the virus. Be our way, our truth, our life, and strengthen our faith in the gift of your final salvation. When we cry out, O everlasting God, hear us, we pray. We entrust ourselves and all our prayers to you, O God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal. Through Jesus Christ, 
our Savior and Lord. Amen. And now if you would please make sure you have your bread and wine or juice and crackers available as we celebrate Holy Communion. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks. He broke it and he gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this to remember me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this to remember me. Let us pray together as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, this is the body of Christ given for you. And this is the blood of Christ shed for you. And now may the body and blood and blessing of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in God's grace. God's peace is with you always. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, who has named and claimed us, calling us your beloved children, you know the secrets of our hearts. When we sin and stray from your paths, you astound us, astound us with your saving grace. For this word of life, we give you thanks. Loving Jesus, living word, in the kingdom of God has come near to you all that was lost has been found. Help us boldly follow wherever you may lead, trusting your promise that we need not fear, for you are with us. For this word of life, we give you thanks. Holy Spirit, the mystery in which we dwell, into your scarcity, your abundance flows. Enliven all communities with your good news. Guide us to love and serve Jesus giving ourselves away for the sake of the world. For this word of life, we give you thanks. All glory to you, holy God, now and forever. Amen. Merciful God, accompany our journey through these 40 days. Renew us in the gift of baptism. that we may provide for those who are poor, pray for those in need, pass from self-indulgence, and above all that we may find our treasure in the life of your son, Jesus Christ, our savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever, amen. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless us now and forever. Amen. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God.